early one Sunday morning in 1993, a family of five was in Colorado and they decided to take a hot air balloon ride to the Aspen Valley. And as they loaded up into the cargo basket, uh, they were going to a very popular destination for these types of tours. Now this uh, pilot has traveled this, this valley many, many times and he has taken many, many tours there. But on this particular day, the hot air balloon got into that area and it was flying at a little bit lower altitude. The wind kicked up just enough to kind of push that balloon heading towards some power lines. In that moment, the eyewitnesses saw what was about to happen and the pilot began to fill the balloon up with hot air and try to make it out of that danger zone right in the nick of time, but was unsuccessful. The balloon ended up striking into the power lines and the whole family of five plus the pilot all lost their life in that accident. You see, that day the pilot broke a very critical rule and didn't put enough hydrogen into that hot air balloon to get it moving up to a safer altitude. And in that decision to fly too low, it began to create a crisis. As I think about this story, as I think about this tragedy, I, I want to ask you today, what, what maybe is the moral to this story? Well, for starters, on Sunday, you need to be in church instead of flying in a hot air balloon. But really, really, the story is this. The hot air balloon really is a great picture. You and I, we need to be filled. We need to be filled with encouragement in our life. And if we go too low, it can cause us to crash in our life and in our relationships. Can you go there where I'm going today? Good morning today and welcome to Mount Ararat. We're glad that you're here this morning. I want to welcome all of you here at Garrisonville campus. I want to welcome all of you over at Colonial Forge watching over there and also those watching in online. Uh, I think this is a great series for us to start our fall in. We've titled the series Habitudes. Habitudes. Taking the word habit, taking the word attitude and mashing them together. And if you've been here the last several weeks, we've been practicing some habitudes that I think can change your life and could change your fall and could change even your future if you'll let it. So this idea of habitudes, the very first habitude is the habitude of gratitude. Three weeks ago, we talked about this practice of seeing your life and being thankful for the things in your life, the habitude of gratitude. Now, if you were here last Sunday, how many of you here last Sunday? Last Sunday, the habitude of humility. And to practice thinking of others. And again, sometimes it's not always natural to do, but very necessary as a follower of Jesus Christ to get us thinking and, and moving in the right direction. Well, today I want to talk to you about a third habitude, the habitude of encouragement. I believe today all of us could benefit from being filled with some encouragement in our life. And I hope that's why you're here today, to let God fill you in a way that could build you. Now, this idea of habitude of, of encouragement is key because when I start thinking about this theme, sometimes we don't always feel what we're talking about, especially when it comes in the area of being thankful and grateful. When I even thought about this idea, how you feel, it, it really is a good driver in our life because we make a lot of decisions on based on what we feel. Today, I had one of those feel moments. I woke up early and I remembered that we were going to go online with prayer and I knew I had to be here a little bit earlier. Well, my normal rhythms is I do get here but sometimes about 5.30 in the morning. I like going in the prayer room and spending some time kind of going over the message, kind of getting quiet, having prayer. And I knew that was going to get a little bit interrupted because of what we were doing this morning. And as I walked out of that, I love doing that online thing, but we walked down here, I felt a little bit rushed. I felt a little bit discouraged, I'll admit it. And I'm thinking, here's the irony. I'm about to preach a message on encouragement, and I'm not feeling encouraged at all. And so even in the thought of that, it's like one of those moments where, you know, I know some days we don't feel like going to work, but we still go. And I'm thinking, if I could call in sick today, I wish I could call in and let somebody else do this message. Because to, to preach on encouragement when I'm not feeling it, I'm thinking, how am I going to fake it till I make it to the end of this day? Well, here we are at the last service. Let's see how I do, right? 
And even in that, I'm thinking that's the opposite of what we're talking about in this series. This series is not about what you feel. This series is about how you think. And thinking about gratefulness, thinking about others, thinking about encouragement, it's where you put your mind even when you don't feel. So I think this is a great way for me to practice what I'm preaching by asking you to go with me into the God's Word to Philippians chapter 2. So turn there with me. Turn there with me. And today, whether you're a believer or not, today, what are we going to think about when we think about this theme of encouragement? Now, I'm going to review last week's message in this way, and I kind of like this. Philippians chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 1 through 5, but I'm going to do it a little bit differently today. Instead of picking the normal translation I use, I'm going to use this writer named Eugene Peterson. He wrote kind of a devotional Bible called The Message where he took God's word and he wrote it with some contemporary thoughts and language. I'm going to read Philippians 2, 1 through 5, the way Eugene Peterson wrote it in the message. Let's see if this might say something to you today. If you've gotten anything out at all of following Christ, if his love has made a difference in your life, if being in the community of the Spirit means anything to you, If you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Don't put yourself aside. Help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage Forget about yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. Philippians 2, 1 through 5. Does that say something to you today? Today as I talk about this idea of encouragement, it really comes back to this tension. What are you willing to risk for relationship? What are you willing to risk for someone else? When I look here at what we've been looking at in the book of Philippians, I love that we're putting our heart in this very book in the fall season because the book of Philippians is a book of joy. And as Paul keeps telling this church then and God's telling us now, our situation doesn't decide our outlook on life. Joy is bigger than whatever you're facing right now. Joy is all about Jesus. And so in this book Paul is trying to remind this church that they can put their mind on the right stuff even when they're not feeling the right stuff in their life. And so in this letter, what we've discovered, what we've read so far, it's this. Paul longed to one day go to Rome. Well, he gets his wish and he appeals to Caesar and he goes to Rome. But when he gets to Rome, they decide to put him away in jail. Now this church that's thousands of miles removed, they hear about Paul's situation. And so they hurt on hearing that news. They get discouraged hearing about Paul being in jail. So what do they decide to do? They decide to take up an offering. They decide to decide to ask somebody to represent their church and to make this long journey all the way to Rome to visit Paul. This one guy in the church says, pick me, I'll do it. He takes this love gift and he makes this thousands of mile journey all the way to Rome and he shows up to encourage Paul. As he's encouraging Paul in his darkest moment, Paul turns around and encourages him and sends this encouragement back to this church. That's why we got this letter. It's Paul's encouraging words to this church. So today if we're going to talk about being encouraged, let's just kind of talk about what this word actually means. You ought to write this down. This is important. The word encourage means to give courage. Is that not good? The word encourage means to give courage. What that looks like is that when we give encouragement, it's oxygen for the soul. It means to affirm the other. It means to to give someone hope. When you give encouragement, encouragement helps them to overcome their obstacles. It helps them to begin to see life in a different perspective. When you give encouragement, you're giving what? You're giving what? Courage. So let's just talk about the opposite of that word. Discouragement. 
if encourage means to give courage, discouragement means to what? To take courage away. And as I think about even that tension, that's why I think this is a troubling message for me to have to get up here and preach. Is because maybe today I'm not feeling the courage that I need to feel. And so in that, how can I still encourage? Now when I start thinking about this idea of encouragement... The reason why I love this book of Philippians, the reason why I feel like it's a good fall season book is because right now we're all trying to begin new routines and new habits. Now, we shouldn't be surprised that trying to get your kids back in the habit of getting up early and going to school is always going to be a chore. The reason it's a chore, if you're raising a middle school or high school kid, is that your kid's rhythm in the summer is what? (laughs) It's what? They're staying up what? All night long. Your kids are staying up late, 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 late. And by the way, when they're staying up late, they got all the lights on in the house and they got the TV. And when the TV's on for a kid, it's always louder, right? I got three floors in my house. Why do you have to have that TV so loud that I can hear it through the vents coming up from the floor? And in the summer, what do the kids do? What do they do? They stay up all night long and they're in and out of the kitchen. They're always cooking and they're doing all this stuff all night long. Why? Because they don't have to do anything the next day. I got to go to work. And they're staying up. And you know what they do the next day? You know what they have the audacity to do the next day? They sleep till about 11 or 12, right? How in the world can you sleep till noon? The day's half over. They're like, oh no, dad, we're going to be up all night, right? <laughs> no, we're just altered at all. And so all of a sudden, school's starting back. And what do you got to do? You got to what? You got to now go to bed early. And you're like, oh, like World War III breaks out, right? You got to go to bed early. Why? Because I got to get up early. And now you got to be out the door before seven. And all of a sudden, we all got problems with our attitude when that's happening. It's this world of fighting a new habit. Because when you're having to also start a new habit, often you're having to what? You're having to end an old habit. And that summer habit of staying up late and staying up all night and getting late, sleeping in late, guess what? That's going to end. And we got to begin the new habit of what? Going to bed early because you got to get up early. And it's like everything about that, we feel the tension. So we can talk about new routines and new habits, but you can't just take a bad habit and stop it. You got to what? You got to rewrite it. You got to replace it. And that replacing it sometimes feels like a battle. Do you need some encouragement today? Come on, you're just a few weeks in. We're building new habits. This is why it's hard for our kids to get up or the night before to pack their stuff and be ready for the next day. Because all summer, they didn't have to be ready for the next day. All summer, they they could get up and do whatever they wanted to do the next day, right? And now that's all changed. But adults, we know this to be true, too. It's like starting workout after we hadn't worked out in months or maybe a year. We know what that first few weeks of workout's going to be. Miserable. And we got to start the routine. But oftentimes, to begin the new habit, you got to end the bad habit. You want to start eating better? That means you got to stop eating all the things you love, right? And that's hard. This is the challenge of a new habit, new routine, is it's always battling the old one. So how do you replace it? That's what we're looking at today. And how do we find some encouragement while we're trying to replace it? Because I don't know about you, I need some courage when I'm facing this kind of stuff. Now, because we're talking about thinking right, I want us to go back to thinking. The idea that God has given you a brain. Isn't that good news? Everybody here, we all have a brain. Praise God. You don't always use it, but you got it. You got it. We all got a brain, God's given it to us, and we've been talking about a certain part of your brain called basal ganglia. Basal ganglia is not an appetizer at Olive Garden, I'm just going to say that. I know it sounds like that, but right now, I'm trying to play with your brain a minute. I just said Olive Garden, some of you right now are thinking about Olive Garden. (laughs) Right now, I know what you're thinking about, you're thinking about breadsticks right now, aren't you? Salad, come on, chicken parm, lasagna. Some of you are like, Todd, stop talking about food. I'm getting hungry right now, right? This is the last hour of the day. Lunch is coming, right? <laughs> but in your brain, fascinating. I just said Olive Garden, and it took you back to a memory of Olive Garden right now. Your brain's amazing. God's made an amazing, amazing part of your body here. But I want to talk about your basal ganglia because that's where you store routines and habits And as you learn new habits that have to override bad habits, that happens in your basal ganglia. Because your brain wants to become efficient. After you repeat something a few times, it stores it away as a habit. Now that's good if it's a good habit because that means you have the ability to try to do something that's hard and to do it enough over time that it will become ingrained automatic into your brain. 
But it also means the same thing about a bad habit. Because a bad habit doesn't need permission either. And if you're an anxious person and you do something when you're anxious and you do it enough, guess what happens? It becomes a habit. It becomes strong. And sometimes overriding a bad habit like, like, like biting your nails, it's hard to override something that has become so ingrained in you. And that's the hard part. That's the hard part. Come on, how many of you like to work out? Come on, raise your hand today if I can testify both campuses. How many of you like to work out? That's only about a third of the hand. So how many of you like to sit on the couch and eat, right? That's everybody else, right? But one day you sit on the couch and you're like, wow, man, my game weight. I'm just different than I used to be. I got to start working out. And so you make a decision. I want to start becoming physically fit. And let's say you decide to start jogging. Or let's say it's walking first and then jogging because you need to get there first. So here's what you're going to need to do. You're going to need to have this cue routine reward to work for you. you got to what? you got to put your shoes out prominently so you see them. You have to actually step over them or you have to trip over them because you got to see them to go, oh, if I don't go work out right now, I won't do it. Come on, I'm a morning person. If I don't do it in the morning, I'll talk myself out of it by the time I get home in the afternoon. I just won't do it. i got to do it right in the morning. That's my cue. That's my routine. And for me, that's what works. I don't know what yours is, but if you're going to work out, what happens is the more you do it over time, It'll start to give you a reward that you'll miss when you're not doing it. That's why when some of you leave it for a while, you want to get back to it because you remember, oh, I love when I felt like that when I was doing that consistently. Routine, cue, routine, reward, it's how you write a habit. It's a habit loop. That's what they've been talking about the last few weeks, a habit loop. Do you know that you have a lot of habit loops in your mind? One of the habit loops you got in your mind and I have in my mind, it's a food loop. I guarantee you this, not Fruit Loop, Food Loop, Food Loop. You, you, you have certain meals you probably eat every 30 days at your house. Your menu probably doesn't change much. Because you know what happens in families? We get familiar with certain foods and we eat those same meals again and again. And then somebody pays attention one day and wife says, we eat the same stuff all the time. So let's try to do something different. And we try it, but it's like starting new, right? Because guess what? If Taco Tuesday's Taco Tuesday, I need tacos on Tuesday, right? Some of you, that's your habit. It's a habit loop. Familiar. Your brain's always looking for patterns. It's always looking for familiar. you got a music taste. You know this? There's certain radio stations you like to listen to. Whether it's classic rock, whether it's country, whether it's top 40, whatever, you listen to it and you love that type of music. You know what will happen when you have your, your station on? You'll listen to some songs on that station that you don't necessarily like, but you won't change it because there's enough familiar there that your mind sinks in and you stay there. Listen, we have these loops, these loops, and sometimes it's trying to override is the hardest part. I think today, if we talk about encouragement, we got to override something that's hard. It's not always easy. Now, I read a book as I studied for this series called The Habit, The Power of a Habit, and it's written by Charles Duhigg. And in his book, he uses an illustration of a guy that I think you might recognize. There's a guy named Tony Dungy. Have you heard of him? He's a football coach. And Tony Dungy actually applied for four NFL jobs, head coaching jobs, before he finally landed his first one with the most stellar team, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Somebody yelled that a minute ago, but the Buccaneers were known as like the basement team in the NFL, a perennial loser team, the doormat, but somehow he kept sharing his coaching philosophy was this. It had to do with how he was going to train his athletes on the power of habits. Here's what he shared in each interview. He said he wanted his players to focus on repeated routines and basic responses throughout training camps, throughout practices. He wanted to get them to to do it so much that they could stop thinking during critical times in the game. They could lower their mistakes and they could simply do what they had been trained to do. We want to lower the penalties, we want to lower the mistakes, we want to do things in the same way, the same way over time, and we can begin to have success. Well, finally, Tampa Bay said it's worth the experience, and they hired him to be their coach. As he began to do this in the early years, he was working hard to try to teach these professional athletes about the routines of his practices. Sure enough, guess what they were doing? They lowered some of their mistakes. They started to have a little bit of success. But what he realized was this, 
that when they got into intense moments in challenging games against division rivals, they always turned back to their old habits when they were under pressure. And as he was trying to process, how do I get them to break out of that kind of default thinking, he shares with us two more ingredients that are needed. You see, it's just not about the cue, routine, reward. You also have to have belief, and you also have to have community. What do I mean by that? What did he mean by that? Well, the idea of belief, for you to really experience a full transformation change, you have to believe the change is possible. And then you have to trust the change that is now happening for you. If you don't trust it, if you don't believe in it, when tough times come, you'll just go back to your old way of thinking, your old way of doing. The other thing he realized you needed is you needed a community of people to believe it too. Because sometimes that community believing it can force you to suspend your disbelief. If you're with people that also believe it too, there's power in what we'll believe together. And he realized that. He began to play on that. And it began to change the outcome of not just Tampa Bay Bucks, but even the power of leading and coaching in the NFL. Now, if you think about this idea of belief and community, I think it's fascinating that here we are in a fall season, and what is our church trying to invite you to take a step to do? The step of doing a group. Isn't that powerful that in your group, what's going to be shared? What we believe about God and his word, and this power of us believing it together. Belief and community to reinforce this habit of us growing spiritually together. See, what's true scientifically is also true spiritually. Isn't that, isn't that interesting to know? Well, Tony Dungy continued to coach the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, but he can never get them to that final game to win in the Super Bowl. And they fired him. The very next year, what happened to Tampa Bay? They won that Super Bowl. Tony Dungy, don't feel sorry for him. He ended up getting rehired too. Where did he go next? The Colts, and that's probably what you were cheering for, not Tampa Bay, right? Yeah. And guess what happens when he goes there? He ends up winning the Super Bowl with Peyton Manning. Power of habit, the power of habit. But sometimes to write the new habit, you got to overwrite the bad habit. Let's go there together. In Philippians chapter 2, as we've been looking here at the scriptures together, I, we have to get personal with what Paul is saying here. And so I want you to get personal about what God is saying to you. And so if I were to ask you to be honest today, here at both services, here at this room, courthouse, even online, I want to ask you a question today. And, and I'm not asking you to respond out loud or with your mouth or with your hand, but I want you to internalize this for yourself. Right now, I want you to ask the question about encouraged or discouraged. Encouraged or discouraged. Right now, you're going to go to work this week. I'm not saying your job is perfect, but right now, can you honestly say I'm encouraged in what I get to do? I feel purpose in what I do. I feel call in what I do. Right now, I'm encouraged at work. Come on. Kids in the room, teenager in the room, right now, you're starting a new school year, you're just a few weeks in. Can you say right now, right now, Pastor, I'm a few weeks in. Right now, I'm encouraged, but we haven't gotten a report card yet, so I'm really encouraged right now, Pastor. And that's me, I'm encouraged. Is that you? Is that you? You're about to leave here today and go home. When you go home today with your family, could you honestly say right now, family's not perfect, but Pastor, we're encouraged right now as a family. We're in a good place right now as a family. See, encouragement, when you're sitting in those seats, this is easy for us to process this. But, but just let me guess that somebody here today is not feeling encouraged in all those arenas of life. Somebody here today could be thinking about work tomorrow, and you're already kind of just thinking about that in a discouraged posture. Because right now, it's, it's not meaningful. Right now, it's not filled with purpose. Right now, it's filled with a lot of discouragement. Is that perhaps you? Some of you, school has just started. We're just a few weeks in, but you know what? Already you're feeling overwhelmed. You're feeling discouraged. And it's honest. You just say, I just, I'm not feeling encouraged there. And some of you right now, when you think about life and family and home and marriage and all those parts, it's like, man, I feel so discouraged, Pastor. Listen, to all of us discouraged people right now in our lives, what does this message mean to us? Because see, sometimes here's what I think we believe. If I am discouraged, then there's no way for me to be able to encourage another. If I don't have it, 
If I don't got it, how can I give it, right? We think that, we think that. Well, today I want to show you something here in Philippians 2 that Paul's trying to help us to understand. He starts off this chapter talking about what humility is. He says it's all about what? It's about valuing others over ourselves, looking to others' interest over our own. In our mindset, having the same mindset, the same attitude as Christ Jesus. And as soon as he finishes describing that, he gives us three examples of it. The first example is Jesus himself. He says, look at Jesus. He's the perfect example of humility. The way he gives to others is beautiful and perfect. And then he speaks about two men in his life. And he talks about their their relationship to him. And he talks about them in the light of encouragement. I want to pick up on these two men that he talks about. Verse 19 in the Bible. Here we go. He says, I hope this. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send you Timothy. Timothy to you soon. That I may also be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like Timothy who will show you genuine and concern for your welfare. For everyone usually looks out for their own interest, but not those who are in Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him to you soon as I see things go well with me and I am confident in the Lord that I myself Paul I may come back to you soon it's Timothy he's like my son did you hear that he's like my son that's the relationship that he feels about this man now look at this other guy's name verse 25 but I think it's necessary to send back to you the guy that you sent to me Epaphrodites Epaphrodites, he came and he served like my brother. He was like my co-worker. He was a fellow soldier. And I send him to you. He is your messenger who you sent here to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you back in the church, right? He's distressed that you heard about that he was sick. He was ill. Indeed, he was ill. He was so ill, he almost died. But God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but also on me, Paul said. He spared me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I'm all the more eager to send him now back to you. And when you see him again, you'll be glad and I will have less anxiety. So then, welcome. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy And honor people like him. Because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his own life to make sure that I was helped. In a way that you yourselves could not give to me. Epaphrodites. Just like Timothy. Paul cares a lot about these two men. Did you see this? These men weren't perfect. But these men demonstrated something that I want to demonstrate to you today. Because I think God wants to fill you up if you'll let him fill you up today. Can you go there? Can you get there? Listen, to practice the habitude of encouragement, I'm going to give you four things to write down. Four ways to practice encouragement. Number one on the list is to make them sincere. To make your encouragement sincere. When Paul talks about Timothy, when Paul Paul talks about Epaphrodites, he uses language of relationship. Timothy's like my son, Epaphrodites is like my brother. He says, these guys, I believe in them and they believe in me. And he makes it sincere. It doesn't come off fake, it doesn't come off manipulative. No, he's genuine in what he's saying about these guys. You know why some of you struggle with encouragement? is because you struggle with being sincere about people. Listen, we live in a world that's filled with fake and phonies. Come on, we know this, right? That a lot of times people will say things about you or to you at work because they're trying to get something out of you. And a lot of times, our, our, what our radar goes up when we start to have, be around people like that. People that are using us versus people that genuinely care about us. Come on, you know this to be true. And encouragement is not good if it's not first sincere. If you're a parent, 
You know this as you're talking to your kids. Come on, kids. You, you, don't, wanna, you don't want anything to be told you unless it's going to be what? Unless it's going to be true. We want we want words that are sincere. We want this at work. We want this at school. We want this at home. Sincerity is a value. Matter of fact, what I love about this next generation, they can sniff out, they can sniff out insincerity like instantly. Right? Come on. That's why I think this millennial generation that's growing bigger and larger, a lot of them are pushing away from church because they don't know if church is a place they can really trust. They're pushing away because they maybe have seen so much abuse within the authority of a body of Christ. And I'm wondering is this if we have not come off genuine and sincere. Authenticity is a huge value for this next generation. And, and I think it's a huge value. If you're going to be a person that can give courage to others, to give encouragement to others, it's got to first be sincere. Come on, does this, does this say something to somebody today? Now the second thing I'd have you write down, and I want you to see this, is not only make it sincere, you got to make them specific. Make your encouragement specific. Specific. This is so key. Because too often we're general when we give compliments. It's too broad. It's too big. It's not personal, right? you got to look at this idea of specific. The idea of being specific is listening clearly to what Paul is pointing out in his friend Epaphrodite's life. He says, this guy is like a brother. That's how much I trust him. But he's also a co-worker. That means I can give him assignments, and I know he's going to come through for me. He's trustworthy, right? He says he's like a soldier, this kingdom of God thing that we're working at and fighting for, man, he's fighting right there shoulder to shoulder with me. I can count on him because of his role in my life. And now I'm going to send him back to you and he's going to show you he's also a messenger. Isn't that good? That's specific. Is that not it? I mean, he is being so clear to what this man has meant to him. To me, I find this so affirming. Because he's affirming all the many parts, all the many roles that this guy is fulfilling in his life. Now let me just kind of make it personal for a minute. This is where I've been undone all morning as I think about this from a personal perspective. Is I'm realizing this in my counseling right now because I'm going through counseling and I'm several months into this deal. Here's what my counselor's pointed out to me. He asked me a lot of questions about my life. He asked me a lot of questions about my relationship with my wife, my kids. And as he's asking me these things, I start telling him about what I feel about my wife. I start what I feel about my kids and what I think about them. And, and as I start saying these things out loud, you know what he has the audacity to ask me? After you talk about your wife, when's the last time you told your wife those things? I'm like, an, oh man, right? I came to counseling to be encouraged. And you just pointed out where I'm missing the mark, right? And here's what I'm discovering in my counseling. I do think positive about a lot of things. I do think encouraging thoughts about my family, about my marriage, about, 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 about the people I work with. I think about them. I think about them. I think about them. But do I say them? Anybody with me there? And I'm realizing I'm having a lot of conversations here that never show up here. Listen. If you're going to encourage somebody, you got to be specific and you got to say it. You got to say it. And I realize that a lot of times I'm not saying the very things that I need to be saying. As I was thinking about that, even in this last seven days, I, in my counseling, he said, here's what I want to challenge you to do because I know how you're wired, Todd. You're type A, you're hard charged, you go, go, go. You think about it and you get you. It gets you meaningful. And as you think about it in a meaningful way, the next thing that happens to you is this. You go to the very next thing and you forget what you were thinking about. Does that happen for anybody? My mind is so rapid that I'll think about it and have good intention. I'm going to say, I'm going to say it. And the next time I see him, I, I've not thought about that anymore because it's in my other thought. I've moved on. So he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to leverage technology. Every time you think, some thought about a person that you want to encourage them, stop right then and there, pull your phone out, and send them the text right there in that moment. Come on, do it. And I started doing that in the last several weeks. You know what I started realizing is? When you start to send that encouragement out, man, people pay attention to that. When you start sharing specific things to people in your life, people start paying attention to that. 
It's amazing that even when we're discouraged, when we give encouragement to others, people actually want to spend time with you. Isn't that amazing? That when you stop being Debbie Downer, people actually enjoy you. When you stop seeing everything as doom and gloom and why is this happening to me and you just give encouragement, all of a sudden, guess what? You become very attractive by people. Because you're not that EGR person anymore. What does that mean? You're not that extra grace required person anymore. That people see you coming and go, oh, buckle up. This is going to be a long conversation, right? But you got to practice it sometimes until it becomes a habit. You got to practice it. You got to practice it. And and as I started practicing it, you know, I'm finding all of a sudden I'm giving courage to some people in my life, the people that I care about. Listen, I'm raising three daughters. You know what that means? It means I got a firstborn. It means I got a baby in the family. You know what it also means? I got a middle child. Come on, how many middle childs out there, right? You always talk about the firstborn. You always cater to the baby. What about me, right? My beautiful Sydney, she's my middle daughter. And I got convicted in my counseling. You know what? It's easy for me to pass the very things that she's accomplishing, the things that she's doing. And so God got on me this last seven days and said, you know what? Be specific with her. Tell her what you're seeing in her. And all of a sudden, it started coming to me. Man, my daughter, Sydney, she is such a servant. She just recently got a job at Chick-fil-A. Come on, my pleasure, right? (laughs) And not only is she eager to get dressed and be there way ahead of time, she's willing to stay late if they needed her, and she's working hard. Maybe you've seen her. And I am so proud. I am so proud of how responsible she's a hard worker, and she is connecting well. And you know what? We didn't really push her that hard to get this job. Matter of fact, we're kind of going, are you sure? You got school. We're about to be balancing a lot more. You got cross country. And you know what I found is this. She is managing all these worlds extremely well right now. I needed to tell her that. I needed to say that. She needed to hear that for me. You might even see her out here in our cafe. She serves coffee in the, on Sunday mornings, and she's a servant, and she loves to serve. Guess what? I don't need to think that. I need to say that, and I need to be specific about that. And as I think about those words that she's now receiving back, I start seeing what she's re- giving back to me. It's powerful. It's powerful. Listen, I'm not taking away the face-to-face. Face-to-face is always best. I'll tell you that. And you know what it's created? It's created the next moment, the next time we see each other, to be reminded of our text and say it where we can say it live in real color. But I'm here to tell you, maybe you got to start there to build the habit there, to get the loop going again, to go, man, every time I think about it. I've been doing this to my friends this week. They've been thinking, are you okay? Are you okay? Right? Because I'm sending words as I'm thinking about them. I'm praying for them about specific things. I want them to know I'm thinking about them. And I want them to know I want to build them and encourage them. Because that's what God wants us to do. I want to do it so many times that it becomes what? A routine, an automatic where I don't even think about it. I'm just doing it because I just do it. I just do it. Are you with me? Paul's showing us something here. When he's loving these two guys up, he's putting them out there as encouraging men in his life, and he's turning around and showing the encouragement they can be. And I started thinking about all the people that you have in your life, all the people I have in my life. Do our people around us know what we think about them? When's the last time they heard it from us? I'm just telling you, when you get sincere and get specific, it'll change the very context of your relationships. You know this to be true. Two more things, write these down. Number three, number three, you need to make it public. You need to make it public. This is my most favorite point in this sermon today. I I want you to go with me into the story of God here right here in Philippians. I want you to think about this. Here we go, here we go. They're having church one day in Philippi. And as they're worshiping the Lord and saying, Jesus is the only way, and, and they're singing this joy to the Lord, they hear news that their friend Paul, their pastor that planted this church, started this church, is now in Rome, but he's in jail. And they begin to feel this pain of, well, who's getting him food? If people don't bring him food, he's going to starve to death and die in jail. So they prayed about his situation, and then they took up an offering, and they collected money, and they said, somebody's got to go, remember? And then Epaphrodites is saying, pick me, pick me, pick me, I'll be the one to go. Knowing this is going to be a long journey that could be months to a year, he takes this gift, and he makes this, this, this long journey. Now think about Paul on his end. Paul's sitting in jail. He's He's doing what God called him to do, and he finds himself now in prison. 
honoring the Lord. God, I'm doing all the things the right way. Why is this happening, right? He's not asking that. He's just what? He's enduring that. But he's a real person. I wonder if he thought when he was sitting in jail, I wonder if anybody remembers me. You see, maybe because I'm out of sight and out of mind, they don't remember me anymore. See, it wasn't our day and age. They couldn't look at his profile on Facebook and find out how he's doing, right? He couldn't text them, right? He couldn't call them, right? No, it was months or a year away from a letter coming to correspond with each other. I wonder if he was sitting in jail and it had been weeks since he's eaten and him going, man, is this going to be the day I die physically? I wonder what's going to happen to me. And on that day of great discouragement was the day that Epaphrodite shows up. Could you imagine? Oh, my words, my brother. It's, my, it's from my former church. Hey, what are you doing? You made it all the way here to Rome. And about that time, he gets this loaf of bread maybe handed in. And he gets to eat again. And he gets to get strong again. He gets to get encouragement again. He's so blessed. He's like, I'm so blessed that you came to see me. And he says, tell me. Tell me what's going on in Philippi. Tell me about the church. And they catch up long enough for him to hear some of the stress. Some of the pain, some of the struggle that's happening there now. And he wants to encourage them. But about that time, he, he wants to write a letter and he wants to send it back. But he can't send it back yet because Epaphrodites it says he has gotten sick. Remember? And not just like a cold, but he'd gotten so sick that they think he's going to die. And word now gets back to the church back there that not only do they send one of their own to come there, the one that they sent looks like is going to die in Rome trying to take care of Paul. So they're now stressed out. That they sent him on this mission trip and this guy got killed on a mission trip. Wouldn't that be painful? But yet in this recovery, Paul says he brings Epaphrodites back to strength again. Now, what does Paul want to do? This letter that he'd been working on, he wants to send it back, but he wants to send it back with the person that's going to matter. And Epaphroditus now has this letter, and he carries it all the way back, and he delivers it to the pastor of the church. Can you just imagine this? And then they see him, they're going, he's back! Epaphroditus is back! He didn't die! He's back home! And they have this worship service, right? This huge potluck. You can imagine it, right? And they're all here having church, worshiping Jesus. And all of a sudden, he hands this letter. The pastor opens up the letter, and then the pastor starts to read this letter. Because this is what they did with those letters back then. They were written to the whole congregation. And can you imagine, as he's reading this letter, he gets to the part in the letter where Paul is talking about Epaphrodites. Can you imagine Epaphrodites sitting in, sitting in that pew, good to be home, and all of a sudden he hears his name, and he hears what Paul, the leader, the pastor's talking, all of a sudden he's what? He's just leaning up a little bit more. Why? Because he's getting praised publicly in front of the whole church. Come on, can you imagine what that felt like? Sure you can. You've had a moment where you swelled up. You've had a moment where you've been bragged about. You've had a moment where you've had a promotion. You've had a moment where you received an award. You had a moment where you were the one, and everybody was like cheering and going, way to go, good job. And you're like, oh, man, that's me. This is what's happening to Epaphrodites in that moment. And look at what Paul says. Paul says it's so beautiful. He says, he says welcome him with great joy. What he did, he risked his own life and safety to come to me to represent you. And now I send him back to you. Come on, you got to honor people like that. you got to honor him. He's an amazing man. And could you imagine Epaphrodite sitting there going, man, he's talking about me. Huge. It's public though, isn't it? Listen, I, I love my wife and my kids, but you know what I realize? I, I, sometimes I think it and I don't say it. And then when I finally do say it, I just say it to them. But you know what I need to do? I need to say it out loud where others can hear it. I heard one pastor say, it's called reverse gossip. <laughs> Let it get back to your kids that you've been talking about them, but more than talking about them, you've been bragging about them. You've been so proud of them. And, and talk about it in a way where it gets back to that coworker. It gets back to your boss because you're saying something powerful about them. And they get to hear that from someone else. There's something powerful about public, is it not? 
There's something about that that does something deep within us. Listen, I was in the first service, and this is where God wrecked me and feeling discontent and looking at the front row and seeing my wife there and realizing that I think a lot of powerful thoughts about her, but I don't say it enough to her. Man, I don't say it enough out loud. I've got an amazing wife. It's a miracle of God that she said yes 25 years ago. It's a more miracle that she's 25 years later still saying I do to me. She is phenomenal. I couldn't do what I do without her in my life. And she's so good at what she does. She's such a good mom. Man, she does so much for our girls. And I would say most of it gets unappreciated. Come on, moms, you know that. And you know what my wife does? She keeps doing it. Why? Because she loves her family. And she loves us and she serves us and she's good to us. Her, her dad was here the last two weeks and I get to see again. My wife's an amazing daughter. The way she loves her dad is just beautiful. And then when I see her as a friend in my life, I love sharing more with her. And that's where I'm trying to get better at this. But you know what? As I say it out loud, it even does my heart more. Because I want to give credit where credit is due. And there's something about being public with our praise. And, and it's not just my wife and my kids. You know what? My staff needs to hear it. My coworkers need to hear it. They need to hear it sincere. They need to hear it. They need to hear it specific. They need to hear it public. There's something about this. Come on, men in the room. When you're wanting to honor your wife and love her up and send her flowers, send them to her work. You want everybody in that office to say, where did you get those flowers? And she'd get to say, oh, my husband sent them to me. Now, don't do it tomorrow because they'll have to get pastor credit for that one. But <laughs> a few weeks, it becomes your idea, right? But there's something about being public. When we celebrate public, there's something about that encouragement that gives courage. It gives courage. Is this speaking to somebody today? Now, when I think about this last point, I want to read the verse, Ephesians 4, 29. It says, do not let any wholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful in building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit all who listen. Listen, it might not be a habit of encouragement. Do it when it's awkward. Do it when it's not a habit yet. And do it again and repeat it again and repeat it again till it becomes a habit in your life to where you become a blessing giver because you're such a powerful encourager. But number four is you got to make it personal. Make encouragement personal. And that's the hardest part because there's always a risk in letting people know how you feel. Isn't that true? There's always a risk of opening yourself up to be vulnerable to say how you feel about people. Why? There's a risk that they might not repeat it back to you. There's a risk that they might not reciprocate it. And the scariest risk of all is that they might actually reject it. There's something in our in our natural spirit that doesn't want to feel rejection. And so we often hold back because we're afraid to take the risk to say how we really feel. Because what if they don't feel the same thing too? Now you could look at this on a lot of paths, a lot of avenues, a lot of relationships. Matter of fact, I'm just dumping so much private stuff out loud today. I'll just go ahead and keep on going, not even in the notes. This last week I was talking with my oldest daughter, Hannah. And she said, Dad, I, I'm, I'm thinking about dating. Now, if you know my daughter Hannah, she's not dated many guys. And because of that lack of relationship in that realm, she doesn't have a lot of confidence. Now, if you know anything about my daughter, she's got lots of confidence. And she's very sure and she's very driven about what she knows she is. But when it comes to this aspect of her life, she's not real sure. And so we were having this conversation about risking in relationships. And one thing I wanted to tell my daughter, and I know you tell your kids too, is don't ever be somebody you're not. Don't try to put on a mask or a front and try to, because you know what you're going to find? You can't keep that up very long, and it'll be exhausting, and you won't be really who you are. It won't be you. It won't be sincere. I said, Hannah, you just be who you are. If this guy wants to pursue that relationship, and you believe it's a right, God-centered relationship, then you take a step forward and take a risk. And you know what my daughter had, she said back to me, she said, but dad, I'm scared. 
She said, I'm scared because what if I take that step and he doesn't take the step? And what if he rejects me? And you know what I said? Isn't that really the risk? Any relationship takes a risk. But what's the risk of no risk? See, a lot of us, that's what happens. We get to a place where we stop taking steps because we don't want to be hurt. But you know what? If you don't take the risk and make yourself vulnerable, you'll never know if that relationship could have been more. There's always going to be a step. There's always going to be a risk. Listen, I know as spiritually speaking, sometimes we're afraid to lay ourselves out there. But can I tell you, when you choose to encourage others, I believe it's worth the risk. Paul shows us it's worth the risk. However, if you want to go deeper in a relationship, you don't get there without the risk. So I want you to think about something in your life right now. I want you to think about your relationships right now. And again, you can think school, home, and work. But I'm wondering right now if the fear of rejection is keeping you from being the, the leader, the teacher, the boss, the coworker, the friend, the loved one, the spouse the parent, the child that you need to be? Do the people that maybe you're leading right now, the people that are underneath your watch care, do they know what you think about them? And I might even push a little harder and say, when's the last time you said it out loud to them? And if you have to think a long time to answer that question, then I'll answer it for you. It's been too long. It's been too long. It's time to take another step. It's time to say it again. Why? Because the air leaks. It leaks. Encouragement leaks. It doesn't last forever. You got to what? You got to keep refilling it and refilling it and refilling it. And so when I say it that way, I want you to think about your life because today you're either giving courage or you're giving discourage. You're either giving encouragement or you're giving discouragement. Are you willing to take the risk or are you willing to take the risk of not risking? There's a book that was also referred recently to me by Don Clifton and Tom Rath. They, they wrote a book called How Full Is Your Bucket? Strategies for Life and Work. In this book, they talk about this invisible metaphor of a bucket. They say when your bucket is full, you feel the most encouraged. When your bucket is empty, you feel the most discouraged. And what they say in this book about life and work is oftentimes when our, our bucket is empty and we're discouraged, we think that we have nothing to give to someone else if our bucket is empty. But they actually challenge the opposite. They said if you're discouraged, that's the perfect time for you to give encouragement to others. Because what happens is kind of a supernatural thing that as you begin to encourage others and fill other people's buckets and encourage others and be a blessing to others, all of a sudden you don't even realize you're starting to, you're starting to get full in your own bucket yourself. It's powerful how that works. That what you think you can't give is the very thing you have to give. And as you give it, God begins to fill you in a way. We actually get stronger as we encourage others. Is that not a spiritual truth today for us to hear? Whew, what a messy day we've had in this message today. And I said it all morning and, and kind of somewhat tongue in cheek. But if I only preach to myself today, praise God I came to church today. I'm glad pastor didn't call in sick today for Todd Gaston because I needed to be reminded of how encouraged I really am. I'm going to ask our worship team to come back up. And as they come back up at both campuses, we're going to kind of land this message. And, and I want to tell you about one more part of my life since I've been Mr. Vulnerable today. Um, a lot of times in our lives, our lives are shaped by our childhood. And I know a lot of adults in the room, a lot of adults watching online, this is us. And I'm not one of these guys that says blame everything on your past. Blame everything on your childhood. It's my daddy issues. That's everything about my life. No, we got to find a way to overcome our past. But we cannot deny that we have been shaped by the families that we grew up in. Now the blessing for some of you is that you grew up in families that were far from perfect. But they at least loved one another well. And you grew up in a family where you were encouraged. Come on, is that you? Is that you? And as your parents loved you, as you loved them over time, they, they filled your life with lots of belief about you. 
as they walked you through stages of life, they believed in you. They built you up. When you were scared, they encouraged you, right? Come on, some of you, that's your life. If people ask me, how did I grow up? I say this, I grew up in a loving family. I had a mom that loved me, I had a dad that loved me. But like many of you, I grew up in a divorced family. I don't have a memory of living with my dad. He was always weekend dad until he moved out of state. And then he was summer dad, spring break dad, Christmas dad. And all these years later, I find myself still, still wrestling sometimes with that issue. 47 years old, it's crazy. But there's days that I just still long. I long for my dad just to speak that encouragement into my life, to say, son, I'm proud of you. Son, I'm for you. And, and it's sometimes in that gap that I fill the gap in with a lot of insecurity. Come on, you've been there with me? And I wonder, do I really matter to my dad, right? And it's in that time frame, this last few years, my dad kind of hit a moment in his life where he was turning 70. And I felt loud and clear, God says, I want you to bless your dad. And so I started thinking about, okay, what can I do to bless my dad? I wanna give him something, not just a monetary thing. I wanna give him something that's personal, that speaks hope to him, encouragement to him. But sometimes when we feel like, man, but I hadn't gotten gotten that from him. How do I give something I hadn't ever gotten from him? But God says, give it. You've gotten it from me, give him. Give him the love that I put in your heart. And so I started doing this exercise where I got out old scrapbooks. I tried to look at pictures, the few pictures I had of me and him as a kid. And and, and I had these moments where we went. And we actually, I I remembered a trip that we went on as a young kid, just me and him. And then I remembered another trip that I went on where where I was a little bit older. I just graduated from high school. And we went to Big Bend together. And we camped out and went on the river of Lajitas and and did all these different things by the Rio Grande. And and in this moment, I started re Remembering things that what that leaked out and I'd forgotten. I started seeing pictures and I found a few letters. Now here's what's powerful. I found some letters my dad wrote to me and some pictures. And one of the pictures was this picture right here. You can't see it in this book, but it's it's this picture right here. 1978, my dad was working for ERA real estate. And He had this moment where he was going to do this hot air balloon trip all around Texas. He said, son, would you come and spend a week with me on this trip? So I went with him down to Galveston and we went to several little towns there and we had this balloon and we'd blow up this balloon and people would come out and we would take them up in the basket and go up and come down. And there was a few places where we let go and, and flew the balloon for many, many miles to the next destination. And this was a picture of of my childhood with my dad, just me and him on this trip. Well, he wrote me some letters that he never gave to me, that my stepmom gave to me the year I graduated from high school. I read them back then and they touched me then, but I'd forgotten them until I started doing this exercise of putting this little book together. And I reread those letters. And in this project of trying to encourage my dad, all of a sudden, guess who got encouraged? I did. Out of a bucket that I thought was empty, now all of a sudden just doing this, I felt like God was was making me full. Are you with me? And I realized encouragement, it leaks. It leaks and we think we're run out of it and we gotta be reminded of it again. But then I started thinking about my life with my kids and what will be our relationship. Listen, this is a habitude worth fighting for. We gotta fight for this. This is not always gonna be easy. But we gotta practice the habit of being grateful. And the way we do it is by encouraging, by encouraging, by encouraging. What do people in your life need? They need sincere words. What do they need? Specific words. Come on, what do they need? They need them to be public from time to time. What do they need? They need to make sure they're personal. I want you to do something for me, and you might not be a believer here today, and this might be weird, but I want you to do something that I think God says you can be challenged in today. I want you to think of five people right now in your life. Come on, five people, and God's already putting the names right there. And I want you just to stop at five. I know the list could get bigger, but I want you to think of five people, and I want you to do something today. I want you to write down all five of those names.
Maybe there's somebody really close to your life. Maybe there's somebody that's a little bit distant from you right now. I want you to put on all five names. And then in that time of putting their names on a paper, I want you to write how you could possibly encourage each one of them in a very way that we talked about today. And then after you do it privately with just you and God, I want to give you a seven-day window to turn around and to do that and to give that to those five people. And maybe it's something as simple as texting the message to them. Or maybe it's someone you need to pick up the phone and call. Maybe it's somebody you can get and say, we got to meet face to face. There's some things I need to share with you. And I promise you this, if you will trust God in this move, if you will take the risk, I can't guarantee how each person will respond, but you're going to feel full as you step out in faith to do this. Don't miss a moment for God to fill your life up. Matter of fact, when I think about what Jesus Christ has done for me, that's exactly what he wants to do for me. The God the Father wants to fill my life up with Jesus, his son, and to fill my life up with his Holy Spirit. And when he fills me up, oh, I have exactly what I need to give encouragement to others. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, good news. Today, God wants to fill you. God wants to fill you. Will you take a risky step to trust Him to be your hope? But there's a lot of believers here today, and God spoke to you today, didn't He? Now what are you going to do with what you just heard? Are you willing to practice the habitude of encouragement? Come on. Come on. Father God, thank You. Thank You for being such a personal God to us. Thank You, God, that Your Bible is filled with real people. Thank you for Paul and for Timothy and Epaphrodites, God. Thank you for the relationship that we get to have a window in right here in the book of Philippians. And God, as they loved each other and encouraged one another, God, may we practice that same kind of encouragement in our window of life. God, we walk out of this place today. Would you give us the courage to take that risky step for five people in our life? And God, may we repeat it and repeat it, and repeat it in a way that it becomes a habit in our head and in our heart. Thank you, Jesus, for making a way for us. We trust you, God, to lead us forward. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.